Hey, welcome everybody. Um, thanks for joining us. Uh, Ask a Barnica Bay Scientist webinar tonight. Um, the Turtle Truth about Barnica Bay's Diamondback Terebinths, presented by Dr. John Wenick. Uh, I'm Karen Walzer, the Public Outreach Coordinator with the Barnica Bay Partnership. Um, just want to go over a few tips for communicating with us uh, during the webinar. Um, if you put your cursor down near the bottom of the screen, you'll see a row of circular icons and you can submit your questions to us um, either using the chat, which is the little talk bubble. It's the third circle from the right, or you can use the, the Q&A um, to open that. You see the second circle um, from the right has the three dots. Click on that, and then you'll be able to click on Q&A. So whichever you, you prefer, I'll be monitoring both. And then Dr. Wenick will take a couple breaks um, to answer some questions. Um, so again, we are so pleased. Thank you very much, Dr. Wenick, for joining us tonight. Um, a little introduction. Um, over the past 19 years, Dr. Wenick has been conducting research in the Barnica Bay on diamondback terrapins. He's also the supervisor of science and research at MAPES, um, soon to retire. Um, he continues to coordinate the Project Terrapin project and direct Barnica Bay terrapin research. So thank you very much, Dr. Wenick. Thank and you. It's all yours. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. And um, hello, everybody. Well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to have a, a little bit of an overview. And if you could see on this like regular intro slide, there's um, there's our mascot. His name is Scoots. Um, those are the little plates on the terrapin. So our students years ago, we got this mascot at the mate school, and we call it Scoots. So I'm going to have like breaks in there. So whenever you see like a slide and Scoots is in there, that's that indicates to me that it's good good time to ask questions or you know take a break and and so forth. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to just start with a introduction a little bit about diamondback terrapins um, the type of turtle that live in estuaries so some of you may know this some of you this might be new information we'll go through that and then i'm going to talk about some of the research here and some new findings that we had um, this year um, using tech some of the new technologies um, to kind of help us understand our population a little bit more so terrapins in general are a type of turtle that live exclusively in estuaries that mixture of uh, salt and fresh water and they're found from about Well Fleet, Massachusetts on the Cape, all the way down into Corpus Christi, Texas. They're probably found down in Mexico at some point too, but it's uh, a little bit tough to study them down in that area um, just because of the terrain and everything else and getting down there. But um, in the US, you'll find them along the East and Gulf Coast of the United States. There's also what we call subspecies. Um, so genetically, there's about four subspecies, but geographically, there's seven subspecies. And we're in the northernmost range. So ours is the northern diamondback terrapin. Um, they're really well adapted for swimming and being on land. Um, their shells, you could see, are, are basically what we call hydrodynamic. They're not raised as much as like a box turtle or a tortoise. So they're able to kind of swim really well in the water. They have webbed feet for swimming. Um, and they also have clawed uh, claws on the end of some of those webbings too that make it unique so they can kind of dig and also um, they could use their front claws for predators. Um, the top shell is called the carapace and the bottom shell is called the plastron. So those are the technical names of the top and bottom shell. And they have these individual plates called scoots. And thus that's where we get our mascots name from. Um, if we're looking at males and females, uh, males are generally smaller than females. Uh, one of the classic pictures is um, one of the Terrapin researchers and I believe that's Willem Rosenberg holding up a female that has the male, you know, on top, perched on top of it. And that's a good general description of a mature female versus a mature male. Um, using the stats from our area, our males mature in about three to seven years. If their head started, which means grown in captivity, we've seen maturity or male characteristics in about a year. Um, we had some amazing growth from some of our schools this year in terms of the way they grew out. And when they were males, they were recognizable even in a year. Females, um, in the literature, it says seven to 11 years. We've found a couple of females that we aged at six years old um, that were mature on North Sedge Island. Um, so it is possible if they're eating well and they're growing well, they have to hit a certain size uh, to become mature. So, you know, sometimes it's not just the, the age, it's also the size in which they grow. 
Um, the good thing about them are that um, they will come up to certain areas to reproduce. Um, they don't do it in water, the uh, reproduction, um, as far as coming up to nest. Uh, they come up and nest the females on land. Um, they will produce um, a clutch of eggs. Um, and their their eggs could be anywhere from, you know, we, we have two on there, up to 22. Um, the most we found in a clutch locally here is about 20. Um, we think two eggs may have been a female that came up, wanted to nest, and when she went to, to nest, she didn't complete the nesting and came back another time to, to finish nesting. So that's why we think that there's that low number of two. Um, but they can come up uh, to reproduce, I mean, not reproduce, but to lay eggs three times in a season, uh, which does happen, but it happens for a very small percentage. So it's not, it's not something that's common, it's somewhat rare. Uh, we do have a decent number that come up two times. We're looking at that frequency uh, of individuals that come up, you know, which percentage and some, but it's a very low percentage that comes back three times in a season. And here's what, it, here's what the eggs in a nest will look like. We had this nest that we were relocating and uh, moving those eggs out from a, an area that was a little bit more vulnerable. And it may have even been dug out initially by a predator, but you can see the eggs there. They're about an inch and a half long by about an inch wide. Um, they're kind of pinkish in color. And then we have that close-up that was on the screen all the time in regards to like one of the pens I had. So you can see the size of those. And then once those eggs incubate for basically about two months, maybe three months, the hatchlings will emerge out of the uh, nest cavity and make their way to vegetation. Um, terrapins across the range do have threats though. Um, one of them is, is, is you know, some of the fishing practices like uh, commercial style crab pots, you can see on the left. Um, there's also on the right, a larger net called a fight net. And this was an image out of Maryland back in you know, 2006, um, which led to Maryland closing the whole harvest industry because we were able to harvest terrapins and this net, this net wasn't monitored properly. And sadly enough, those terrapins uh, in that net, most of them drowned. And then damage caused by cars um, when they cross roadways to get to nesting sites. So that does happen. Um, here is a, a little depiction of our work and then other partners we've been working with over the years and how many terrapins we have marked in the Barnicut Bay system. Um, so we have about 5,600 animals marked, and I'll show you what, how we do that. I have you know, some slides down the line. But we, um, we've worked in areas as far north as Caddis Island. Our new study area is um, up in Lavalette. We call it the Northern Shores area, where we're handling Lavalette. Um, Seaside Heights, Ortley Beach, that area. Um, and then we've been doing a lot of work on Sedge Island for, that, that's the 19 seasons we've been working there. Um, and also along North Long Beach Island, there's a project with the Terrapin Nesting Project at LBI and all the way down. Uh, ben Wurst and Conserve Wildlife Foundation in New Jersey are working on Great Bay Boulevard. We did some work back there in 2007, 2008 um, and so forth. So. All of these projects that you see are the active projects have animals that are marked. So that makes our population in Barnicut Bay somewhere around 5,600 animals marked. And if I survey the other partners that are doing this, we're probably closer to about 6,000 animals. Um, so we're, we're trying to get a good handle on, you know, the populations throughout Barnicut Bay and where they're nesting and where they're interacting and so forth. Um, so we, we call this one one processing a terrapin. So when we capture a terrapin, like what do we do? Um, we capture them using different methods. If they're coming up to nest, we kind of intercept them. Um, a lot of times we'll wait till they nest and then when they're returning back to the water, that's when we'll intercept them because we don't want to disturb them. Um, the other thing that we'll do is we'll get them through uh, something called a hoop trap. We put out a humane hoop trap that in the water column and it, it, it attracts the turtles and we can take those terrapins in and then we'll measure them and do so forth. So we'll, we'll get their shell length, their shell width, and we'll get weights on them. Um, we'll also look at the general health to see if there, there's any kind of fungus growing on them. Uh, we'll look at, you know, basically if there's any boat injuries or if they, they did have any kind of um, signs that there was any kind of predation or something, um, you know, in the past uh, that they escaped from. Um, these are some of our field research assistants. This is actually uh, Courtney. Um, she was with us last summer. Uh, she graduated Waynesburg and she's now in a, in a grad program at the uh, St. Joseph's University. Um, she was coordinating a lot of the research on Cedar Rundock Road. You can see she 
she was very good at collecting the terrapins. And we also put an individual uh, code in them or notch in them uh, on their shell so we know which individuals which. And I'll explain that in a minute why we do that. And uh, here's another thing that we do too. We, um, there's a tray in front of you and each of those is a, a loaded little needle and we put in a passive integrated transponder tag. So it's a small tag that gets inserted. So one of the, one of the questions that we always are asked to notch or not to notch. You know, like, why are we notching out the turtles if we're going to put one of those transponder tags on, those pit tags? And I have some slides down the line that kind of show you why that was important. Um, anyway, one of the reasons we want to do that is we want to, one, you know, identify the turtle without having to kind of scan it. So if we didn't have our scanner to scan those pit tags, just like you have with a cat or dog, you go to a vet and they wave that wand over them, we have that same mechanism. Um, if we didn't have that available, we could tell it was a marked animal. Um, and in New Jersey, terrapins were able to be harvested up until about three years ago. And at that point, um, Governor Christie, when he was in office, signed um, off legislation to put into law that terrapins are not allowed to be harvested anymore. Prior to that, there was a harvest. And you could take them from the months of November through the end of March. They had to have a shell size, that's the carapace or top shell, five inches or larger for you to harvest them. And in New Jersey, the only way to collect them legally was to kind of get them in shallow water or waters where you could go in physically and grab them. You weren't allowed to use large dredges. You weren't allowed to use rakes or anything. So what had happened was um, there were some incidents in other states where they were allowed to um, raise terrapins. You know, they, they have something called like an aquaculture kind of system where they breed terrapins and they sell the hatchlings overseas. And one such, one such entity in Maryland um, ended up um, trying to um, go for a permit to sell terrapins under the CITES agreement with U.S. Fish and Wildlife uh, Service. They were trying to sell like, like 15,000 terrapins overseas. And when the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service investigated, they said, well, how many turtles do you have um, as your breeding stock, and where did you get them? Because you're not allowed to get them from Maryland anymore. They said, well, we were able to buy them from New Jersey. When they looked at the paperwork, it looked pretty legal. They investigated the animals. They were all the right size and everything. Um, and they investigated the people up here in New Jersey, and they said, no, we, we took them legally within the time frame. So the long and the short was when they went back the next year to kind of see what was going on, they did a little bit of, of a little reconnaissance there, a little undercover work, and found out that some of the individuals that were supplying other states like Maryland were going out and using illegal practices to take the terrapins but hiding it. Um, and they got in trouble, um, the people collecting them and so forth. And then you fast forward a little bit to a couple of years ago, um, we had an incident on Great Bay Boulevard right here in you know good old Ocean County um, where a number of terrapins were taken, eggs were taken, hatchlings were taken, we think individuals were taken, and a person in Pennsylvania that did this uh, was um, charged and is paying a, a, a massive penalty and I believe is getting jail time. Um, but my point was, or is, if we mark them, then they're not just, you know, they're not just, a, you know, a terrapin that's part of the project, they're actually New Jersey's terrapins and it's visible. So maybe that would discourage poachers from taking them if they have if they're marked because they know that they're marked. It's hard if somebody takes thousands of terrapins to go and try to scan them all. You know that that's a difficult thing. But if they're visibly marked, they might discourage them from taking them. So that's why we kind of do that. And we use this marking system here where we use these things called scoots, and you can see on the outer edge are what they call marginal scoots. And there's about tw there's 24 of them. I shouldn't say about. I say that because some terrapins don't have quite 24, but a uh, high majority of them do, um, and there's, and we give them a different de designation. We give them an A through X designation. The one that's really kind of in line with all these, the the middle of that, you can see the raised middle, it's called nuchal. That one is part of its backbone, so we don't want to touch that. But we will then give them an individual code, um, and this one would be HQVW because we actually put a little V and use the file to notch those. And it really um, is, is, is like us trimming our fingernails because it's made of carotene, the material um, that makes up the scoots, and the blood vessels are back towards these other 
plates called the Costco scoots, the ones that are more interior. So um, it's just like us trimming our fingernails. Um, and once again, it gives them an individual code and we'll also put in a fit tag. Um, so one of the areas, like I said, we're working on is Cedar Run Dock Road down in Stafford Township. And we're also working at the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service um, Edwin B. Forsyth Cedar Bonnet Island area. And we um, marked about 600 terrapins the past two years there um, on that. But overall, if I put in, you know, some of the other work that we've done there, we have about 11 or 1,200 animals now marked on Cedar Run. Um, area. And um, when we do notch them, we also get a picture. So here's here's a male terrapin. We put the uh, the little letters that you have. My daughter, when she was younger, she had this. So this comes in handy for us. Now we could use those letters, the magnetic letters, give them their code there and get a picture. So we have a picture of most of our terrapins. And we also get blood samples to run. Um, we've done some genetic work in the past to see relatedness of the populations in terms of doing genetic work. This, a lot of this work was done by one of my colleagues back at Drexel, Claire Sheraton, um, and we've taken some samples, but we haven't run a lot recently. Um, we also, we were talking about marking, and this, this is about um, a terrapin locally, and we named her Bailey. We had a, a campaign out to name a terrapin. She was a terrapin taken from Great Bay Boulevard, and she was brought to, here's how the, here's a rough part of the story. We're trying to get to fill in the gaps. She was brought to Tennessee, somehow then brought up to Massachusetts and last possessed by somebody in Maine. Um, we, we encountered her because when she was in Maine, she was brought to a veterinarian. So I don't know if she was having some issues or whatever, but the veterinarian um, used their scanner and scanned and found out that it had a code or tag. Um, it then immediately called the New England Aquarium up in Boston, Massachusetts, to just inquire if there's anyone doing terrapin work because terrapins are not native to Maine. So they, you know, that was not a terrapin's habitat. So the closest was Massachusetts. Massachusetts, um, you know, contacted a couple programs, one at Wellfleet, uh, Don Lewis down um, in Buzzards Bay, um, and they said, no, that's not a code that we work with. Um, so they put it out to us on a list listserv the code, and when I looked at the code, and you can see that yellow iron, that's what we use to scan the terrapins for the pit tag. That's why I didn't put it in earlier, because you can see it right here. And that's the code of the turtle that was up in Maine, and it matched up to our records. And we um, ended up um, finding out that she was initially marked on Great Bay Boulevard back in 2008. Uh, ben Worse from Conserved Wildlife found her again in 2013, and he has a record of her. And we also had genetic work done back. You know, when we talk about the blood samples, we had blood samples from her if they needed that back from 2008. We had that categorized. So through the Turtle Survival Alliance, TSA, um, they ended up arranging that turtle to be taken back from Maine and shipped down to us at Mates, where I work. And then we immediately called um, Island Jen, um, Clayton, and Kelly Scott from Island Beach State Park to. Um, ask if they would keep, keep her because the turtle, she's boxed in, that's Bailey, we ended up naming her, but Ellie is their captive animal that was part of our head start. And Ellie had some visual perception problems that I didn't want to release Ellie. So this new setup or newer setup they have at Island Beach is excellent. And Bailey's been kept there since the winter time, thanks to uh, Jen and Kelly and uh, even Ellie. Um, and uh, right now what we're doing is we're assessing the health of, of uh, Bailey and Ellie too, since they're tank mates, but we're also going, uh, we're also assessing, I said going to, but we've been assessing the population at Great Bay where she, we're thinking about putting her back or releasing her. That hasn't been determined yet, but we wanna make sure that her health condition is conducive and she didn't pick anything up. Um, these turtles can actually get upper respiratory infections like us, we can get mycoplasma that leads to like pneumonia, mostly walking pneumonia for us. They actually get it as an upper respiratory infection and they can um, either show the effects or, you know, talk about COVID, you know, the same type of thing, or they could be carriers um, or eventually show the effects when they get stressed or something else happens. So um, she tested negative for that. And we're now doing some other samples on her, her, her uh, fecal to see if she has anything in her waist. 
but everything else checked out. She doesn't have any type of virus and the population she's going to doesn't show anything that's actually um, fear. So that's something we have to talk about, about how she can acclimate back into the wild after being in captivity. Um, so that's the story of Bailey. And because we had her marked, uh, she also had some notches, but they weren't as discernible. So if somebody didn't know what they were looking at, they didn't see them, but they were obviously there when we saw her. But that pit tag was really the, you know, something that helped us to trace her back here. And once again, she was illegally taken because that was well past when the government signed that into action. And here's a little bit more, and this is the break time for, for questions. There's Ben, help, you know, he was there, grabbed 30 turtles. That's what those buckets are where our scoots, the mascot is. And we set up a, a, um, a I call it a, almost like a triage center. Um, on the bottom is, um, on the left is uh, one of the state fish and, uh, fish and wildlife veterinarians, Nicole Lewis. And then also um, endangered and non-game species. Um, one of the uh, people working with herpet, uh, herpet, uh, herps, you know, the, the turtles and the amphibians is uh, Brian Zarati. Um, so I'm going to take some questions out if you have any, because we have the screen. Okay. Um, whoa. <laughs> there is a question. I'm hearing weird feedback. I hope it's not coming from me. Um, how do you detect visual perception problems in a terrapin? Oh, that's that's for us. It's basically if we put something out in front of her, like response to food or anything, she was having a hard time kind of seeing where the food was. We would have to like hold it like right up in front of her. Um, and usually you could put it out, especially in clear, like clear water, water that, you know, basically looks like drinking water. If you put something in there, they should be able to spot that and go after that. And she just didn't didn't seem to be responding to those things too well. Um, sorry. The other question is, what are the objections to a sustainable harvest of the terrapin in New Jersey? Well, one of the one of the problems are in some of the areas in New Jersey, um, the terrapin populations are are in decline. In other areas. The terrapin populations are very high, but it's really difficult to kind of manage those. And the other thing with that is there's there's a couple factors. One, there's a illegal, you know, it's illegal to kind of sell them, but there's a lot of activity online for sales. So um, people that are breeding them to sell online illegally and stuff like that, they look for all those little holes to try to try to find places that they can get terrapins um, and that that's an issue as well because they're kind of taking them out of the population and so forth but for sustainable harvest it really just depends on you know where they're coming from and that's kind of hard to determine and then the other thing that's really difficult to determine is where where are they going um years ago um they were a very popular food item for stews and soups here in the united states but one of the key ingredients that they needed to cook them with is was alcohol, like cooking sherry. And back when prohibition came about, around, you know, they um, what had happened was people couldn't get alcohol to cook the terrapins. And when they found out how terrible they actually tasted, <laughs> it wasn't as appealing. Um, so what happened was uh, the the demand for terrapins in terms of a food source went down significantly in the United States. But there's markets overseas that are trying to do that. So I think regulating that becomes a little bit more difficult and where's the demand here? And we do know that their habitat is in decline. Uh, we, we do agree that there's places that have very dense populations. I, you know, I, I might wanna put Great Bay Boulevard in that, but we know that with um, sea level rise, coastal erosion, um, development, you know, some of these processes, if those habitats that are behind there can't keep up with that, that's going to totally degrade or 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 start to uh, wash away the terrap you know the terrapin habitat or erode away the terrapin habitat I should say and there's also a lot of threats for mortality uh, road mortality for females that have have limited places to nest um, go across roads that they that used to be nesting areas or they constantly you know go across them they're not thinking about the cars and you know um, crab pots and other fishing gear are also a source for mortality as well. Um, and, you know, that that's something that there's always a threat there for them. So we, we think that across the range that there's greater reduction of habitat, greater mortality, and 
the population, you know, in general of terrapins, if we added in a harvest, may cause a severe decline. But I, I could tell you though, in some areas, I mean, they they're, they look like they're in, mat, in 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 high numbers, high densities, but that might not be consistent. What we're finding is that from some years to other years, areas that had high densities, some years you don't see as high a density. So there could be a lot more movement with these terrapins to preferred habitat. And that also kind of makes us question, you know, um, a harvest or anything like that too. You know, are we really getting those numbers in those places or are these populations, you know, in certain areas kind of moving to different habitats? Okay, one, one more. How did you know Bailey was in Tennessee? And did you ever find out how the people who had her in Maine acquired her? You know, that I, I have a, I, what's going on right now is I believe because it was under investigation that I'm not privy because this becomes, um, this becomes more of a U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service type investigation because it's between or among states. Um, and that information, if they're investigating or if they're not, you know, they don't have all the facts together, they're not going to release it. We knew about the Tennessee because um, there was a general when they did the general inquiry, I got some of that general information back. But as far as like when and how, all we know is it happened sometime after 2013, after Ben Worst, you know, encountered counted her as part of his study there. And we ended up getting her back. And the individual from Maine ended up getting that person from Massachusetts. Could there other be other states involved? Who knows? But, you know, we want to we want to try. I want to try to get the full story. I was hoping to have the story for you today, um, like a little bit more, because I want to do something with that story um, because it's a good learning tool. But we will be doing some uh, work with that, with uh, Division of Fish and Wildlife and with Ben at Conserve Wildlife. We'll probably package that up once we get all our facts together about the health and what we're going to do. We'll try to fill in those blanks uh, as part of a case study. So I guess that's why maybe they're not, you know, going to give me that information until, you know, we're able to kind of release it all together, so. All right. Okay, that's it. All right, so I'm gonna move on and talk about the terrapins at North Sedge Island. Um, one of the things we see, and this is back to that threat I was talking about answering that question, um, we find at North Sedge Island, about 21% of the terrapins that come up have some type of boat injury or a boat propeller injury or something related, you know, to them you know, being or moving in the water, um, you know, to our location. The one on the top right, you know, looks more like a blunt force or something, and it could have been um, from maybe a dredging activity that happened in the in the winter time. We don't know. Uh, we put it down as a boat injury, but looking back on it, it might be a little bit. It might be more of a boat injury, but definitely the one circled on the bottom right, boat injury. One that I took that picture cut across the bottom. That's that's indication of a cut, usually a double cut is an indication of the boat propeller, like one to strike and another one to kind of hit another area if it's a larger female. So we know that on North Sedge Island because we know the females have to come from a different area to come there to nest. It doesn't provide a habitat that we think the females are staying immediately around that island. We think they're dispersing throughout that whole marine conservation zone area or maybe even a little bit outside of it. And that puts them in an in, in area where there's gonna be boat traffic. If you think about it, I'll have a map here, but North Sedge Island is is right off of Southern Island Beach State Park and it's adjacent to the Oyster Creek Channel and also to the Mud Channel that's behind it. So, you know, there's a good chance of a female swimming through, you know, she, she could get a prop. Um, this um, is a terrapin that was hit. That was not great. That's, um, I believe that's on Cedar Run Dock Road. The one on the right, though, was hit. It looked like it was hit by a boat and it came across its uh, its mouth or or you can see where the jaw, it's kind of hard to see. It looks like it has a nose, but that's like actually a cut. We worked with her and got her back to the wild. So she was released. So back to North Sedge Island, this is what I was talking about. Um, there's the area off of, um, of Island Beach State Park that circled. Um, it was off the wall nesting. The caretakers at the time were Jackie and Tony to leave them up to there. Um, some of the terrapins that come and nest there, you know, are, are, have been there from 2002 when we started the project. Here's some of the nesting areas on North Sedge Island. Um, there's a education center there, and then there's also the caretakers shack on the right-hand side 
on that left picture, uh, North Sedge Island. Uh, we have a hatchery. One of the things that we talked about being out there is that there's an education center and we wanted to make sure that um, the people that were interacting didn't step on terrapins ne nesting or you know, trample on cages that sometimes we protect the nest with. So we decided to build this hatchery for education purposes and also um, to, to kind of find out more about the population there. We recover the hatchlings and we measure the hatchlings and we also know the females that deposit the nest or know most of the females that come up and deposit the nest. Um, and with that, we can kind of look back and see if there's any changes in egg size, egg mass, and also how it leads to their hatchlings and what conditions you know, of the summer uh, produce certain hatchlings. If it's a wetter, cooler summer, chances are you're gonna get um, individuals that may not be as large, um, or they may be in the nest a lot longer because of the cooler conditions. If it's a warm, dry summer, they tend to kind of absorb a lot of material and hatch out. This summer was a pretty much um, our, what we call like our, our typical summer, where we had about a 60 to 70 day window that we were starting to see emergence. So that worked out really well. Um, one of the things we also looked at was um, a result of, of Sandy, and I don't have the graph on here, but after Sandy hit, um, it pushed a lot of water all over, and especially on that island, and we noticed that the summer after, we had the same number of turtles come up to nest. Um, those that were going back to the water, we would grab, and we noticed they had eggs for the most part, and we didn't see any difference amongst the years for that. They still were producing eggs, but they weren't really nesting on the island. Um, the year after Sandy, we saw a significant decline in the number of nesting episodes. We still had the number of turtles coming up on the island, but they chose not to nest. So what we did was, we ran a study for four years where we altered the, um, the soils coming up and we added salt water, kind of mixed a little less salt water, and then we just left it as natural nesting. And the trend was that the terrapins that went to the control, you know, used that no matter where we did. We randomized it so we didn't have one spot that was more favorable than the other. And the one that had high, high means high conductivity. Um, we had no nesting in 2018, and we had our fewer nest attempts there. Um, so we feel that there's some kind of trigger with that overall. Um, so I'm gonna go on, here's some of the ways that we capture some of the terrapins um, over at Spizzle or North um, Cedar Run Dock Road and Island Beach State Park. Um, this was one of the students there that um, was working with a turtle named Bailey. Um, she's holding that turtle. It, it has a logger on it. Um, here's a fike net. Um, so if I go back, I should back. That's a hoop trap on the top. We have a float in it and it kind of goes into the water and it's always, it's always set. We like to set it at high tide and high water so that we know it has space in it so that if the water comes up again during the next high tide cycle, we know that we're safe and we put an extra float in there so none of the turtles could drown because terrapins, if they're down for even even this time of year for a couple hours or so, they will drown. Um, we also have um, this, this is a big fight net um, to put in a creek so we can really capture some terrapins. We use this at Cedar Run. Uh, one of the things at Cedar Run is that, um, that Cedar Run Dock Road in Stafford, this is a picture from Leslie Gans who lives at the end towards the bay. And this was during one of those nor'easters and the flood events. Um, we know that terrapins use this as a nesting habitat and um, in the winter time, it's not as big a deal because they should have emerged from that nest, but some hatchlings will stay in the nest and overwinter. And if that was the case on this roadway, this would be bad news because the nest would get inundated with water. And then if it was the winter and you know we have those cold temperatures, if it gets cold and that water contacts them, they can, they can die. Uh, one of the things we wanted to know though, working on Cedar Run is if we're marking turtles on Cedar Run and Cedar Run becomes less preferred as a nesting habitat, are the terrapins gonna go over to the Cedar Bonnet Island area that's much higher? And if some of you have gone over to Long Beach Island and went on Route 72, it's on the right-hand side. If you go over the, over the bridge, you'll see it kind of tucked away. And that was an enhanced area where they took uh, dredge material, or I should say recovered material as part of the mitigation uh, project for the bridge. and they built up this habitat and we have um, documented terrapins nesting there, but we want to 
now carry the study out to see if we have any marked animals from Cedar Run that are now going to go to that area. Um, also, you could see above that line, that developed area. I don't know if you can see my cursor over here, but that's that area over there is Beach Haven West. And we're starting a project with Stafford Township on Beach Haven West um, to um, identify nesting areas. And we're working with some residents on um, some terrapin conservation there. So we partnered with Stafford Township recently, and we're going to be doing some work there. And this ties into one of our project areas. Um, this is something we did at Cedar Run and at Sedge last year. We actually put on these, you can see it too, these data loggers and their archival tags. And these will help us collect information on the depth of water that the terrapins are in and the temperature that are, they're exposed to. One of the key things are we need to recover the terrapin to get the data logger back off, and we hope that it lasts a year. Um, we put them on five individuals last summer. Um, this summer we had more of an issue because I didn't have the same field staff and I wasn't confident with the animals that I was encountering. These are animals that I know we see every year. So I go in a database and take animals or females that I know we encountered every year. And I'm using the females because Whenever you're putting like anything on that's going to be long term on an animal, um, you have to just make sure that they're able to swim and, and handle it well. And these are very lightweight. A female, you know, if we had to 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 look at it, a female is probably somewhere around um, two and a half pounds, maybe a little bit under two and a quarter pounds. And these are, you know, basically like a few ounces. Um, so when you're dealing with body weights and stuff, it, it's fine. They're able to respond. Males, a little bit smaller. You've got to be a little bit more you know, careful, get something smaller. So our goal was to try to get a terrapin back. And with COVID this year and not having as, um, I would say, active a staff because I had some volunteers and I'm so thankful for them. Um, but we were able to carry out some work this summer, but it still wasn't to the degree you know, that we normally are able to kind of capture animals and process them because we didn't even have any place to do it. We had to do it out in the field. Um, we were able to actually get one back. And this is the data from, we call her BHIO. Um, she is a female terrapin that was marked in the early 2000s at Sedge and she comes back every year. She returned and provided us with a profile of where she's been. Let me just see, whoop, back one more. Sorry, I'm skipping ahead a little bit. Got excited there. He provided with a profile of how deep she was. So we got to take into account that there's storms, there's also tidal events. But the long and the short is, if you look at the middle of this graph, and I'm going to go show you the temperature, which would be the same middle. When she was wintering, they go into this period called brumation, where their body temperature slow down, and they will stay submerged. Especially females will bury themselves in the mud in areas that they hope, you know, that they won't freeze. But this just goes to show, you know, how much water exposed. So this is in meters. But the fact is that these areas over here are basically about a foot of water. Um, so at times when the tides were out and we have sometimes we get blowout tides, they could almost be totally exposed in some areas. Um, and that's something that we're, we've learned and it's not known about where they're actually hibernating or going into that 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 period in the winter time here in Barnicut Bay, this is kind of shedding a little bit of light because we know that it's in water at times when the water levels are really high, that are no more than probably about four or five feet at extreme high tide events. So um, we're going to do a lot more work in that area to see where they're overwintering, and um, this is kind of exciting. So this is like new data from our logger, we were lucky to get one back. And this is basically the temperature in which he was exposed. And you could see very close, but at no point um, was she at the zero degree Celsius mark. You know, and there's a little bit of a skew on this too. I would say that there's probably about a half a degree Celsius, uh, half a degree Celsius uh, um, variation. But my point is that when she was in this brumation, that overwintering we call it, um, she was in an area that you know, um, was getting close to zero, but not didn't quite, you know, uh, hit zero or an area that if the bay freezes, it's not going to freeze all the way down to the, the bottom. So 
we'll get into conservation and I have a quick, quick break time. And uh, there's Scoots again, looking for questions. <laughs> All right, Scoots. We have a question about, are terrapins able to super cool, um, like shunting water out of their cells to avoid freezing? Um, we, we found, now I don't know too much about the adults, but I do know that hatchlings can super cool. So those that hatchlings that overwinter in the nest, they could super cool. Patrick Baker did a lot of that work um, showing that they could super cool. So the key thing is that if, if they're moisture free or they're not in contact with something that's kind of freezing, they will be able to tolerate conditions that are below freezing um, in some of the nest hibernacula, we call it. Um, but as far as, you know, we're talking about like the females that are submerged, if they even bury themselves a little bit into the sediment on the bottom, there's a good chance that that's not going to free, especially if it's, it's, it's undergoing tidal movement and everything else like that. We've seen individuals actually bury themselves, juveniles, in the marsh. They look like they occupied filler crab burrows um, in the wintertime. And in the marsh, because of those conditions in the marsh, um, a lot of times there's, there's heat being generated and it's enough to keep that from freezing all the way down. So that's another way that they survive. The, um, the next question is, if you see an opened nest at this time of the year with egg pieces, how can you tell if they hatched or were attacked by a predator? Is there a way to tell? Usually, usually if they're um, in the nest cavity and they're kind of opened up and, it, and there's kind of like an emergence, um, I should, grab something at the next break, I'll actually grab something because I do have some. Um, you could tell if they hatched out. Um, if they're kind of peeled back or found on the surface itself, that means that there was a predator. So if they're at the surface outside of the nest, there definitely was a predator. Um, if it's inside the nest cavity um, and you could see, you could see basically escaped. Actually, try to grab one now. I know it's like uh, it's like radio, right? You can't you can't see. All right, so here you go. I don't know if you can see this, I'm gonna hold it up. So this was a piece. They're usually pieces. So this is from an egg. Where let me hold it up there so you can see it. There you go. Okay, there you go. So this is actually one egg, and it was kind of opened up into two separate pieces where they were able to escape. Um, these were eggs that we had just taken back from. Sedge. So I have one here that we took back from Sedge because we didn't like the condition of them. And the hatchling looks like it's kind of emerging there from this egg. So it's going to kind of open up and a lot of times it'll peel back like a, like a banana. But if it's curled kind of on the inside and it has a hole in it, that was a crow that did that. But crows usually take them out of the nest. They don't bother eating them right there. They'll actually fly away with them. Um, so that, that's another thing. And a raccoon will shred them and it'll look like they were totally peeled. Um, and since we're at the break, too, I do have hatchling from North Sedge Island. This one's from a nest in Lavalette. We started our project in Lavalette and rescued some nests from an area where um, they, there, there's some parking that usually happens during busy weekends. And um, so this is a hatchling right over here. See the pattern on the bottom, too. The, it's very, sometimes it, um, these patterns, definitely have to do with, uh, you know, um, genetics. Um, you could have in the same nest multiple patterns on the bottom. Okay, we're caught up on all the questions. All right. So this is a little bit more. This might help to answer that question too. Here's a nest that we excavated and here's some eggs where hatchlings emerged. See, they're kind of opened up really nice and you knew they kind of occupied, but they still have like that kind of egg batch. And then here's the plots that we set up on North Sedge Island that had the different um, salinity gradients and stuff like that. So that brings us to um, one of the things that we're working on. And we started the project way back in, uh, at the Long Beach Island Foundation. And we partnered with uh, the Barney Bay Partnership, Conserved Wildlife Foundation, and established a turtle garden program. And turtle gardens was kind of coined from Wellfleet, Massachusetts. Uh, the Audubon, Massachusetts Audubon, started a project 
trying to um, enhance areas where terrapins nest because terrapins are on the uh, threatened species list up in Massachusetts. So they started this project. We went up to a presentation. We, we thought it was great and asked if we could use that. And they're like, yeah, great. And we started this project down in this area. And we did a pilot project at the Long Beach Island Foundation of the Arts and Sciences because every year there would be a terrapin in their driveway area that would either have an injury or succumb to some kind of mortality because it would hide under a car. Um, and when the car didn't see it under the tires, which could happen, you know, so even around coastal areas is one of my tips, you know, be careful around an area that might be a nesting area or, you know, place like that, check around the tires first and they back over it and then becomes an issue. Um, and uh, we put that in so we can intercept the turtles before they got to the parking lot. They still get to the parking lot, but they go to the backside now they don't come out to the main parking lot because they use this swatch of, of sand called the turtle garden. And uh, you can see a little bit of a picture. We have two of the students that worked on the garden and, and a little brochure box. It's just that sand area that we cut out. Um, on our website, we have a whole page dedicated to the whole project itself. And uh, we have the signage that's up that talks about living shorelines and turtle gardens and um, knock on whatever, the four years or so since we put it in there, uh, we haven't had a parking lot incident. Uh, we've had them in the back towards the back part uh, of the building, but there's not really any cars back there. So that works out for us. Um, so um, that helped, I think. And turtles have selected it to go and nest. So you see that in the back, we had some cages to um, protect the nest and then the hatchlings can emerge and go back into the vegetation. They love doing that and they make their way to the marsh and then they come back up into the uplands in the winter to bury themselves again. Um, here we go, a little bit of the project, you know, where we have those protection cages with the large mesh. We use such big cages because if you have raccoon or anything, they could easily take a small little cage and just, just throw it right over. Um, these, if we have to use rebar, we would too, but they kind of keep larger animals. Um, I have a really cool picture. One of the uh, people that work at the LBI Foundation showed me a picture of a coyote uh, that they found uh, right, you know, back in uh, that area. Um, so that makes these cages even more important. Coyote would dig these up just like a fox and just eat all of the eggs. And here's the hatchlings emerging, making their way through the sand. Um, here's some collection of hatchlings. And um, you can see too, uh, the staff got involved at the time and so forth. So I'm going to pass up that break. So just to review, here's some of our study areas that we're working on. Um, our Lavalette Northern Short areas that we kind of kicked off this year. Sedge, you know, that's been an ongoing project, uh, spending a lot of time down in Stafford at Cedar Run. And then we're working with the Terrapin Nesting Project at LBI and uh, partner with them in the Holgate um, area with the Long Beach Township Field Station. But we're working with Michelle Budd and Chuck Henry and, uh, you know, hel helping them in whichever way we can. They do an amazing job down there um, collecting data and so forth. And um, here's just a little bit of the, the activity that goes on there. You know, our new Mill Creek project, uh, doing, dealing with signs too, signage, and a lawn sign project. We've been working on Joseph Street, um, just outside of uh, Lavalette. And you can see that too, some of the things that we have going on there. And uh, we'll talk about that too. And I'm gonna briefly talk about uh, one of the other initiatives. Uh, I mentioned before that Terrapins have you know threats, and one of the main one of their threats, I should say, are getting caught in uh, commercial style crab pots, uh, mainly those that are intended to, or you know, abandoned or derelict. And that affects not just terrapins, but other species as bycatch, and even blue crabs, you know, that are captured in them and eventually die. Um, so, uh, one of the projects that I'm really uh, proud to have been affiliated with, and we hope to continue, is for four years we worked um, with Conserve Wildlife Found, uh, Foundation. Uh, through a NOAA uh, marine debris grant. And we identified uh, crab pots uh, with Stockton University and collected them um, you know, throughout Barnicot Bay. Um, some of the techniques involved you know, doing some pre-survey work, side scan sonar, finding these images, and then going across with a grapple hook, uh, taking them up out of the water, and then documenting what's growing on them or if they have any bycatch. Um, that's called the bycatch inventory. You can see here, we had a number of crabs on the top left. A um, couple pots, you know, had smaller mesh and we were able to, you know, find some eels, uh, spider crabs on the top right, and then tog, which are blackfish, 
locally called, you know, um, type of species here that like to uh, occupy structure. Um, some of them were using it for habitat. So that was a that was something too. If the crab pot was open um, and fish could easily go out in or out crabs or any kind of species, technically they're, you know, used for habitat, but we couldn't dis, dis, discriminate that. We, you know, basically took whatever out and they're vinyl coated for the most part. I would say 99% of, of the debris we took out are vinyl coated and that's plastic kind of breaking down in the water. Um, and we don't know the degree that it affects, you know, the species there, but there could be some impact. And these are just a little bit uh, recap from the last couple of years of our project. Um, these are the scientific names there, but basically um, oyster toadfish, um, tog were what, what I was talking about before, the blackfish or the tau tog. Um, they were our most found species. They like structure. And we found blue crabs under the live crabs. And then we also found rock crabs which may, you know, make sense overall um, in those. And we took measurements, we have that data to process. We also recovered some crab pots that were adjacent to salt marsh areas that had terrapin remains. So you could see on the top right were some juvenile terrapin females, it looked like, or possibly some males. It was hard at that point to identify um, them. Um, it could have been mixed, but we um, see that size was able to kind of get in to the crab pots and we took measurements and I would say that we probably recovered about 100 remains of terrapins. Um, this is a local, um, this is a very recent picture down at the Long Beach Township Field Station. Crab pot was kind of sitting on the roadway in front of them, pulled out of the water, and you could see two um, individuals. They were females were caught in the crab crab trap. Somebody must have pulled it out of the water. Some of the cooler things we we found um, outside of the you know the terrapin bones. Those bones are actually those plastro scoots I was talking about in the bottom those bottom scoots, some of them have hooks where they're, and I'll show you where on a picture of a terrapin where, where they would be. They get caught in the mesh of the crab pot. So when we bring them up, we could actually take these, measure them and get the total measurement of the crab, I mean, of the uh, terrapin. But we also, you can see some of the other species that we caught as bycatch flounder, and there's a tog kind of hanging in that pot. We don't know how it got in there because the pot was kind of closed off and it was kind of jammed in there. And we also caught lobster. Um, in Weartown. Actually, two seasons back to back, we caught two lobster in the same location back to back. So, and they were, um, according to the captain, they were legal size. So, I don't know what that meant. But anyway, um, we, we ended up catching those. And here's a terrapin here, and that shows the bones that I have circled over on the left. When we get the remains, sometimes the terrapin shell breaks down so fast that these bones or plates are the only things left. And once again, the ones with the hooks get caught on the mesh of the crab pot and we're able to kind of work with them. So we have these devices. I'll hold them up and I have a picture of them. They're called bycatch reduction devices. They're not required on crab pots in New Jersey unless it's a certain condition. And it's like 150 feet from shoreline to shoreline of mean low water. Um, so that means any, any creek or lagoon, you usually should have to put these on if it's narrow enough. But if it's the open bay or some areas that are wide, you don't need them. And they're basically six inch wide by two inch um, high inserts that go in the funnels of crab pots. And one crab pot we pulled up had the remains of 17 terrapins. And we estimated that if it had a B, uh, B or D in it, it would have excluded those individuals that I have circled from getting into the crab pot and they may not have drowned and they were adult females, you know, that add to the population. So that goes back to why, you know, doing a sustainable harvest is kind of difficult because we don't really know what the populations are like and what would be sustainable because we have to look at all these threats to mortality. And then these is how it works. There's a female trying to get in, but she can't get in to the BRD. And um, there's different sizes in different states. Um, a and B are just prototypes for South Carolina. We use those in a study. That's another whole thing uh, that we could talk about. And the one that's the bottom right is what they use in Maryland. So it's a little bit smaller than New Jersey. And they're required in all recreational pots in uh, Maryland. Uh, we looked at commercial crabs versus recreational crab pots. There's a no blame game for our project. It's not one type of crab pot that's doing, it's not commercial totally and recreational is not making an impact. We feel that it, it's basically a combination of just crab pots, you know, whether it's commercial or, or recreational. We could tell recreational from commercial. I'm not gonna go crazy into that, but here's a distribution of the crab pots. The green were recreational, red were commercial. You can see certain zones where you would find more you know, where we recovered them um, than other areas. But if you just look at the general num, you know, the general types, 
they're pretty much even, you know, as far as what was abandoned or left out there. So over those years, we collected, you know, basically over, you know, 2,100 derelict items, most of those crab pots. We studied the movement of the crab pots during high energy events. We did a pilot study, very cool. They, they do move. Um, and I have just one slide to show that. And then we also looked at BRDs and how um, they affected crab catch. Um, they were very positive. Here's that movement study. Like we had one, we tracked the movement of this. So from October 25th to um, January 2nd of that same year, um, that was a movement of a recreational crab pot on a sandy bottom off of Weartown. The rest of them showed very, you know, little little movement. Uh, we had a we had a commercial in the middle, but um, in that location, we had a, you know, we showed some movement over there. So with them moving means that the funnels are exposed and they're constantly collecting, and they're moving towards the shoreline, which you may encounter crab pots. And this is just for reference. I'm not going to go crazy with that. These are just the night types of crab pots that are available. And one of the key things that we always say with with crabbing is, you know, crab pots. You know, use the use the BRDs if you can. We we found in our study that it did not significantly impact like the size or number of crabs caught, and it actually any BRD we used even in New Jersey, which is a larger one, um, in our pilot study we caught like 1,100 crabs. Uh, crab uh, used like 16 crab pots over two weeks. We didn't catch any bycatch, um, but when we took the BRDs out, our control pots, which were regular pots, did catch bycatch. We caught actually a couple of terrapins, we caught um, flounder and, you know, uh, cow tog. So, you know, it's something to kind of, you know, think about just having a BRD and even New Jersey size is, is going to help you know, maintain your crab catch and it's going to reduce bycatch. And, you know, some of our partners like Jacquisto National Estuary Research Reserve have some workshops. We've crabnewjersey.org has some more information. Stockton's been a leader in this and they have this rigged right program. So if you are going to fish a commercial style crab pot, you know, and you're going to put it out in the water to float, not just off your dock, you know, use, you know, use a float sinkable line, um, some type of escape panel so that if it gets lost down there, there's iron tabs that will, will kind of corrode and open up and allow the crab pot to come in. And then what, what you could do to help, you know, with, we're talking about, you know, uh, Project Terrapin, we do need more turtle gardens, you know, in certain areas, like uh, we do need, areas that we're seeing nesting taking place, but there's less areas for them to nest. We come and assess those areas and find out if it's a good area to put sand or not, if it's a good candidate site, um, where the hatchlings also have a place to go when they hatch and come out, and that's important. Um, we're gonna relaunch our Terrapin sighting program that we worked on way back with uh, Conserve Wildlife Foundation, and also try to partner it with, say, Barnica Bay in the future, um, so we can kind of get more information on sightings um, we also work with the state on that, so that's a big one too. And then I put LBI on there, but that goes across the board for everybody, like support efforts everywhere for beach grass planting, volunteer monitoring. Uh, we're gonna have nest cover production, um, you know, so we're making these nest cages for certain areas, um, sign making. We found that homemade signs um, are paid attention to a little bit more because people don't see them as a regular everyday like landscape. Sometimes you'll have a sign, even in your community, or I have one in front of my house, and I keep forgetting it's here, and I have to go back and check it. That, oh, it's pedestrian crossing. I, you know, if somebody asked me that, I probably wouldn't have known it because it becomes part of my subconscious. But if somebody puts something up seasonally, there's like more of a more of an urgency to it. Um, so that's something. And then some of the partners that are kind of working in this area, you know, besides us at Project Terrapin, Conserve Wildlife, uh, Terrapin Nesting Project, our friends down in Stone Harbor at the Wetlands Institute have been doing terrapin work for decades. And um, the Margate Terrapin Rescue Project down um, looking at the Margate Bridge and Kim Lowell has been doing some great work with the volunteers. So if you can get out and help any of those projects, that'll be great. Um, and uh, we need your help. That's our terrapins always say that. They're a little bit shy, but that's what they say. Um, and, you know, um, they're part of our future. They're, they're being a steward is really important. We have a program where we head start with certain schools and we have a release day, which is one of my favorite days of the year. Um, my amazing students over at Mates um, over the years that are part of Project Terrapin and all different divisions get out um, in you know, some of our sign projects with adopt the lawn sign. And we I have to include our amazing 2019 summer team. I don't, you know, we haven't had a full team this year, but we've had some amazing individuals this year helping us out 
Um, you can see the difference. Everybody was together in 2019. So those pictures without the masks are last year. Um, and you can see our, our road team with the masks on in 2020. And then also the uh, Berger family. I wanna give a shout out to them um, for everything that they've been doing. They've been amazing on Cedar Run Dock Road um, and helping out with patrols and, and getting data on I naturalist and really made our season uh, a, a success or else we would, uh, you know, um, we wouldn't have been able to do it without them. So the family came out and did all that work. Um, and I'm really proud of the group because over the over those two years, we had 850 Terrapin captures um, that we had to process and measure. So um, I'm open to questions. Oh, here it scoots again, asking a question. So uh, we're here for the uh, final question. So when back when you were talking about the crab pots having the vinyl coating, someone asked if there are any concerns with microplastics and the terrapins. Um, that's that's something that we're we're doing some work on. Um, not us, but in general, I belong to the Dimeback Terrapin Working Group, and one of the things we're looking at is, you know, as we're able to determine plastics, you know, in some of their what we call like prey items we could now possibly detect if there's any kind of like bioaccumulation factor or any type of factor from those plastics breaking down and, and, and giving off other type of chemicals that may be affecting them. So I think you're gonna see a lot more work in that area as we're learning more about the effects of microplastics on planktonic communities that are actually you know, uh, magnifying up the food chain. Um, so that's something that uh, you're that's definitely on the cutting edge. And if you know of any students, grad students, or anything that want to work on that, I have tons of projects out there um, for for people to work on. And, um, and thankfully, I'm able to partner with some of the universities, um, and we're working with on some of these. Uh, not that question, but other questions related to health and all that type of stuff. So that kind of fits in exactly with that, you know, with the health conditions too. You know, is that affecting terrapin health overall? You know, I don't see. Let me do a quick check. Uh, oh, OK, there is one more terrapin um, sexual development is temperature dependent. What impact from climate change is concerned for this species? And one of the things um, that we've been looking at and we've had some modeling done. Matter of fact, it was um, I believe it was Karen Liu that did some work with uh, conserved wildlife uh, way back a study that she did. She was looking at some of our nesting areas and um, gathering temperatures. And that's something that we do at our turtle garden spots and some natural spots. We're putting in these eye buttons to look at nest temperatures because we wanna see over time. The, the strategy that Terrapins use this temperature dependence favors female development. Um, that's why even for alligators and crocodiles, it's backwards. Like cooler temperatures produce females. That's because alligators and crocodiles are usually nesting in areas that are more shaded, and the temperatures are cooler by those riversides or you know those those wetlands areas, and that favors more females. But the problem is with climate change, you could have such an enhanced temperature variation that you favor even more females, or you could even get what they call lethal temperatures in the nest because you can go above a certain threshold for a period of time. And we're looking at, and one of the things we wanna study is um, we wanna study different substrate that they're nesting in. If they're in compacted areas and they can't dig down deep enough, their nests seem to be more angular. So they're not digging straight down, they're digging more in an angle, which means that their eggs are actually higher up. And if they're exposed more, higher up, that means that they could be incubating at a higher temperature. And it goes back to what you're saying, with climate change, you know, with warmer temperatures, we could see um, this, this favor, you know, not only favoring females, but favoring females to a point where we'll see less males in the population, and that could totally uh, affect genetics. So that's, you know, that's something to look at in the long term. So the, all these studies that are happening with nesting, if we can start recording these temperatures and nest depth, that's really big. We have a lot of data on nest depth and some temperatures um, that we haven't been able to even mine yet. So, um, you know, that that's that's on my plate um, to do. 
and I, I thank everybody for, for letting me talk Terrapin. I, I love talking Terrapin. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Dr. Wenick. Fantastic as always, and um, very enjoyable. And everyone, uh, thank you for for joining us tonight. And um, Dr. Wenick, it, I, if you don't mind, I did share your um, Project Terrapin at Gmail um, email because someone asked how they could contact you about. Oh um, sure, yeah, yeah, that'd be great because we look forward. To, we, we have so many things on the horizon, and especially when we're looking at some of these project areas, we want to get more people involved in helping us with survey. You know, like, like, like I said, I was thankful to the Berger family for coming out and we were able to get observations this summer when we normally wouldn't get as many, but more specifically, we'll have things for people to do more and more now, especially with our partners too. Yep, absolutely. Lots of, lots of good opportunities to volunteer and help out. All right, so All right. Um, th thanks everyone for joining us. Um, it, don't forget, if you've got a couple extra minutes to just fill out the evaluation, um, you know, once once we end the webinar. Um, and thank you again, Dr. Wenick. Oh, no problem, stay, stay well everybody, it was fun.